we've been working our way through a period of history in the book of Revelation called the Great Tribulation. It's a, it's a final period, a very difficult time just before Jesus comes back. And if you study this period of history, most people associate it with judgment, with God intervening in history to uh, call people to account for the way they've lived. And so that's a, that is a huge theme. We spent all last week talking about different judgments that, that God's pouring out through these uh, breaking seals, blowing trumpets, pouring out bowls. But in addition to this, and this is what I want to spend uh, the rest of our time on today, is alongside judgment, kind of sprinkled all the way through this period and all the way through this book, is the theme of salvation. It's the theme of God going to great lengths to reach people that are far from Him, doing everything He can, pulling out all the stops to draw people that are far from God into a relationship with Him. And so uh, you see this tension all the way through the book. One place you see it is between the blowing of the sixth and the seventh trumpets. We're kind of in an interlude in, the, in those trumpets being blown and these judgments being poured out. During this pause in the action... Uh, John is told to eat a scroll. And this scroll is kind of like having like hot and spicy chicken wings and then paying for it the day later. You know, it's, check this out. It says he took a little scroll, which is basically a symbol of God's message, out of the hand of an angel. And by the way, there's this really cool graphic novel you can get. I, I don't have the title of the book of Revelation, just with some super cool illustrations. I just put a sample up there. So the aged John grabs this little scroll out of the angel's hand, and he's told he should eat it. Eat this scroll. And so he does. I ate it, he says, and my mouth was as sweet as honey uh, when I had eaten it, but my stomach was made bitter. You know, tasted good on the way down, but then I felt terrible. And that sweetness is what we're going to get into, the sweetness, the hope, the, uh, the, the work that God is doing to try to reach people that he loves. That's really what we're going to get a taste of, even in the midst of all this bitterness that we, that we looked at last week. Now, I've quoted this verse quite a bit, and I want, to, I want to say something about it right at the beginning just to frame our talk. It says, the Lord isn't slow about his promise, as some count slowness, but he's patient toward you, not wishing for any to perish, but for all to come to repentance. Okay, so this, this is basically saying that God would do anything to avoid seeing people perish. And you know, when I say I wish for a certain outcome, it's pretty much all I do. I just wish for it. But when God says I wish that none would perish, that is a commitment that he's making to humanity to do everything he possibly can to reach as many people as, as possible. And so we're going to see that just him, just God going nuts to try to reach people. All right, and so that's what we're going to focus on, these efforts, God's efforts to reach people during the Great Tribulation. Now, we've already seen a little bit of this. A couple weeks ago, we talked about God sealing or protecting 144,000 Jewish bond servants who were going all over the planet telling people how to come into a relationship with God. And it was evident that they had reached a ton of people. And so that's a huge global effort that we see on behalf of these, these bond servants of God. We also talked about last week that even the judgments themselves, as, as terrible as they are, a key goal of these judgments is to get people's attention and draw them back to God. That's why, as you read about several judgments, you keep hearing this phrase, but they did not repent. You know, this happened, and they did not repent. That happened, and they did not repent. What's, what's the obvious implication? God wants them to. God's hoping that these calamities will wake people up and help them realize they need a relationship with God. So yeah, even so far, that's what we've seen. And the next thing we see, the next effort we see 
uh, for God to reach people is in chapter 11, and he works through these, <laughs> these guys are, these are some of the craziest characters in the whole Bible. These two witnesses. Let's just read about it. Revelation 11, 1. Then there was given me a measuring rod, like a staff, and someone said, get up and measure the temple of God and the altar and those who worship in it. Leave out the court, which is outside the temple, and don't measure it, for it has been given to the nations, and they'll tread underfoot the holy city for 42 months. Okay, so uh, this, this is describing what seems to be a temple in the future. you got to realize, John's writing this book in 95 AD, uh, 95 AD. That's 25 years after the Romans destroyed the Jewish temple in 70 AD. And that's led some, some scholars, many scholars, to conclude that this temple must be some kind of symbol. Not a literal temple, but maybe a metaphor or a symbol for the church. They would point out, and it's true, you can read several places in the New Testament where the people of God are described as a temple, as living stones being built up into a temple to God. So the idea that that imagery is in the New Testament is true. The problem is, in this case, this building, the temple, is distinguished from people coming into it to worship. And this building also has an altar and a court and so it has, it has features that you'd see in an actual temple. And it's not in heaven, and it's not in some ethereal symbolic plane. It's in the holy city. And if you keep reading down in this, this chapter, he says this holy city is where their Lord was crucified. Okay, that is an unmistakable reference to Jerusalem. Okay, so th what we're looking at in Revelation 11.1 1 here is a physical a temple that doesn't, doesn't exist yet, but that will be rebuilt at some point before the end of history, a temple located in Jerusalem. Now, we've talked how uh, prophecies in the Bible often seem unlikely to come to pass. You know, the prediction, for example, that uh, the whole nation of Israel would be reconstituted back in the land at the end of history. Very seemingly unlikely, and yet it happened. And, you know, and it is true right now, if you look at um, different passages or you know, the actual uh, location of the temple here, this is the Temple Mount in Jerusalem, and uh, this is probably the most hotly contested chunk of real estate anywhere on the planet. That little plot of land is, uh, yeah, this is a huge point of, uh, of tension between lots of different people. Now, I, I wanted to go back here and just point out, our passage in Revelation is not the only place that the Bible says a temple will exist at the end of history. This is a passage about the Antichrist in 2 Thessalonians. And look what it says. It says that he will exalt himself and defy everything that people call God, and every object of worship, he'll even sit in the temple of God, claiming that he himself is God. Okay, so the Bible really does envision a future where this spot will one day have a Jewish temple. Now, there's actually an Islamic uh, religious trust that uh, serves as the custodian of this location. And they're not excited about a temple being built here uh, because of this. That's the Dome of the Rock. This is a, 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 the third most holy place in Islam. And it's on or very near to the site of the original temple. Back in uh, 2013, the Washington Post interviewed the custodian of this site, the director of this religious trust. And he said, this place belongs to the Muslim people. And no others have the right to pray here. If they try to take over the mosque, this will be the end of time. This will create rage and anger not only in the West Bank, but all over the Islamic world. And only God knows what will happen. Now, there's a lot there to think about, but the part I absolutely agree with is that God knows what will happen. And if I'm reading this passage correctly, 
God says that one day a temple will be here, maybe not on the exact spot of the old temple, but on this hill somewhere, this thing will be rebuilt. And that's the site of what we're reading about here in chapter 11. Well, it says there was given a measuring rod like a staff to John, and someone said, get up and measure in the temple of God and the altar and those who worship it. Uh, in it, leave out the court which is outside the temple and don't measure it, for it's been given to the nations and they'll tread underfoot the holy city. So this this measuring rod, like I read, um, this is this is something you see a lot in the Old Testament. People are told to measure things. You'll see this in Ezekiel, Zechariah, Daniel, and measuring is a way of God expressing His intent to exert his control over what is being measured. God is signaling by having John measure this temple, he's about to influence what's happening here. And the, per- the people he tries to influence through are these two witnesses. He says, I'll grant authority to my two witnesses and they'll prophesy for 1260 days clothed in sackcloth. These are the two olive trees and the two lampstands that stand before the Lord of the earth. Now, these are actually two people, and uh, they're getting up and they're speaking in a way that the whole planet can hear. And they do two basic things. The first thing they do as they're speaking is they're calling down judgment. That's very evident from what you keep reading. It says, if anyone wants to harm these two witnesses, fire flows out of their mouth and devours their enemies. You can imagine that. So if anyone wants to harm them, he must be killed in this way. These have the power to shut up the sky so that the rain won't fall during the days of their prophesying. Now, if you know a little bit of Old Testament, this should have jogged your memory. These are episodes. He is referring to specific episodes from the ministry of Elijah the prophet. On a couple different occasions, Elijah called down fire from heaven. He spoke, and fire came down from heaven to destroy God's enemies. And there's another episode in Elijah's ministry where he prayed that God would bring a drought on the land of Israel, and God did. He shut up the sky so that rain would not fall. Okay, so that's clearly, that's the imagery he's borrowing from, from the Old Testament. And then here we've got these witnesses have the power over waters to turn them into blood and to strike the earth with every plague as often as they desire. Now, where have you heard that before? Who, uh, who was known for doing that? Moses, right, yeah. The, another famous prophet was known for turning water into blood and for calling down plagues. And so what we're supposed to get from, both of the, from all of this is these two witnesses, like Elijah and Moses, almost in an identical way, are going to be speaking and praying and bringing judgment down on humanity, probably some of those bowl and trumpet judgments that we've been studying. So that's one aspect. They call down judgment from God. Now, the other aspect of what they do that bears on what we're talking about is they prophesy. For some reason, people forget to talk about this, but this is the main thing that they're doing is they're prophesying, not necessarily predicting the future, but just speaking to God, speaking to the people of the earth about their need to turn to God. And prophesy, uh, to prophesy is just to speak a word of God's truth to a specific group of people in a specific situation. And in this situation, the world's about to end. And people are rebelling against God. And these guys are pleading with people to turn away from sin and toward God, to repent, to own the fact that they've been sinful and move back toward God. And so they prophesy. And they prophesy for quite a while. They're serving in this role, it says, for 1,260 days. Okay, that's 42 months of 30 days each. Three and a half months years of these prophets appealing to humanity to turn back to God. I, I think, that, I mean, that, 
That's an extensive attempt on God's part working through these two witnesses to reach people. And so, uh, obviously, if, if they're calling down judgment on earth, they're probably not very popular, right? So, when they finish their testimony, it says, the beast that comes up out of the abyss will make war with them and overcome them and kill them. Okay, now this is the first time we run into this title, the beast. There are actually three different beasts in the book of Revelation. This first beast, the beast from the abyss, is Satan. We read about why that's true back in Revelation 9. Uh, the second beast, the beast that comes from the sea, is in Revelation 13. We know him as the Antichrist. And then in chapter 13, there's another beast called the false prophet. And so these three guys are kind of like an unholy trinity, and they collaborate to do bad things. Uh, but this particular beast, Satan himself kills these witnesses. And, and so after they die, their dead bodies are laying on the street of the great city. Here again, we read this mystically called Sodom and Egypt, where their Lord was crucified. So we've got these just the corpses. I know this is a crazy scene of these two witnesses just laying on the streets of Jerusalem. And then those from the peoples and tribes and tongues and nations will look at their dead bodies for three and a half days and they won't permit their dead bodies to be laid in a tomb. So and this, this is an incredible, uh, if we're getting this right, an incredible situation. You've got everyone on the planet that's what that means, that phrase means there. Every, all humanity is somehow able to look at the dead bodies of these two witnesses simultaneously in Jerusalem. And I think for an author that lived 2,000 years ago, this kind of thing would be inconceivable. I mean, how could you even, how could something like this even be possible? It wasn't really until the last, what, 65 years, maybe, in the advent of TV and satellites that something like this would even be possible. I mean, this, and this is so typical of the Bible, this is the Bible's vision of the future, which for centuries probably seemed like crazy talk. But today, as we get closer to the end, we're like, yeah, of course, satellite, this is like Global News Network or whatever. Why wouldn't something like this be on the news? So yeah, that's the scene. And so they're laying there, and those who dwell on the earth will rejoice over them and celebrate. And they'll send gifts to one another, because these two prophets tormented those who dwell on the earth. So it's going to be like Happy Dead Prophets Day. You know, people are going to, it's going to be an anti-Christmas where you have a gift exchange, like, you know, let's do cocaine together. I don't know what it is. Uh, you got to realize this is a window into how hostile people during this period of history are going to be toward God, right? And so they rejoice, and right as uh, you know, they're taking the day off work to start to really get into a party. It says after three and a half days, the breath of life from God came back into these prophets, and they stood back on their feet, and great fear fell upon those who were watching them. I bet. <laughs> I can only imagine seeing these guys like, Argh! and we're back. And then, though, uh, it says these two witnesses heard a loud voice from heaven saying, come up here. And they went up to heaven in the cloud, and their enemies watched them. So you can imagine, you know, if you were on the earth and you saw these guys depart, how would you feel? Relieved, right? But that's not the way they should feel, because the departure of these two witnesses signals the end, the final round of judgments, which are laid out in chapter 16. As soon as they exit the scene, the worst part of the Great Tribulation begins. And so there you go. Uh, but just think about this. So far, you got 144,000 Jewish bond servants going to every corner of the planet telling people about Christ. You got the judgments designed to wake people up and help them see their need for Christ. And you've got these two crazy guys uh, who are acting kind of like Old Testament prophets to call people 
into a relationship with God, to call them to own their sin and turn to God. That's a lot of effort. And it's not just this. If you keep reading, another thing that happens in this passage is that Jesus himself, in a moment, like in a really dire moment, makes himself known to the people of Israel and Jerusalem. Check this out. It says, in that hour, there was a great earthquake and a tenth of the city fell. 7,000 people were killed in the earthquake and the rest were terrified. Oh, and what did they do? They gave glory to the God of heaven. Okay, this is the same group of people that were partying over the death of the dead prophets. Now they're giving glory to God. There's been a total heart change. After this earthquake and after these survivors uh, come through it, they, instead of being godless, give glory to the God of heaven. What, in the, what on earth would induce such a rapid change in all these people's hearts? Well, if you read in the, uh, in the book of Zechariah, uh, it describes this exact same period of time in very similar language, this, the latter part of this uh, terrible great tribulation. And listen to what it says. Zechariah says, I'll pour out on the house of David and on the inhabitants of Jerusalem, the spirit of grace and of supplication, so that they'll look on me whom they have pierced, and they will mourn for him as one mourns for an only son. Okay, this is not Zechariah speaking. Zechariah doesn't pour out the spirit of grace. That's God speaking, describing himself as having been pierced by his own people as, as an only son. This is a very clear reference. If you read how the New Testament authors cite this passage, this is a reference to Jesus, our pierced Messiah, who died on the cross for our sins. And so in addition to all these other things we've discussed, we've got these three things we've, we've talked about, but also Jesus saying, it's me, to his people, and, and just this large chunk of Jews in Jerusalem turning to him. And you know, so there's all this, all these attempts for God to reach people, but not just that. If you jump ahead to chapter 14, just in case there's anyone anywhere on the planet that might still turn to God, we read about this angel who circles the earth. And I don't know if you've heard about this. This is an amazing thing. And it's it's in chapter 14. John says, I saw another angel flying in mid-heaven. That's like his word for the sky. Having an eternal gospel to preach to those who live on the earth and to every nation and tribe and tongue and people. And he said with a loud voice, fear God. So this, is, this angel is circling the planet, apparently, going to everyone on the earth. And he's saying with a loud voice, fear God and give him glory because the hour of his judgment, like right now, this hour of judgment has come. Worship, worship him who made the heaven and the earth and the sea and springs of water. Wow. So I mean, what, co what comes to your mind as you read this? I was, I was trying to think about, like, is this really an angel? And I don't know how else to take it. Every reference to an angel in this book is referring to actual angelic individuals who are doing different things as part of the story. I think we're looking at something maybe like this. I know that sounds crazy. It looks like he's looking at his cell phone uh, as he flies by. <laughs> but perhaps what John is seeing is one of many angels going around and with a booming voice laying out this, this message to turn to God again. Or maybe this. Maybe it's one really loud angel with a mullet that's trying to reach people. Uh, probably not the second. I don't know. It, I'm not exactly sure how this is all going to play out, but I am sure about this. This is very evidently a last-ditch effort to reach people with a message the Bible calls the gospel. It's, it's this very simple, clear message that any human being who has the humility to own their sin and who turns to God, turns to Christ for forgiveness, who looks to Him, 
for their salvation can have it. And that final uh, effort, global effort, will complete uh, God's attempts to reach people during this time. You know, this is not the last day, he says. This is the last hour. This is it. Uh, this is their last chance to do what, what his booming voice says. Fear God and, and, and recognize who he is. This is your final chance. You know, if you've ever uh, tried to jump on a boat while it's pulling away from a dock, you ever try to do that? I have. <laughs> Got to make sure that the gap is jumpable because there's a point where it's too late. You know, it just you're stuck on shore. And this is that moment for humanity. And this is a reminder that while we do want to weigh things out, we do not have forever to decide. It's good to think and to reason and, and to work things out, but that's not enough. We have to reach a decision point, and that's a finite amount of time. And if we decide, I'm not sure, and this day comes, your, your I'm not sure will be no thanks, right? You cannot stay neutral forever. There's a point where every human being is going to have to choose God or not, and this is that point. And so, you know, when you look at all these different things that the Lord is doing to reach people, when he says, I wish that none perish, but that all come to a repentance. He means it. He meant it. He's committed to pursuing people everywhere they go, all through their life, through whatever means he possibly can to get their attention. And this whole book is evidence of that. And this is something God is still doing today still doing in each of our lives. Every person on this planet, God is still vigorously working to reach people. And I want to kind of just uh, think a little bit about how God does this. Um, you may, it may feel like, I, I don't know, I, I, it's hard for me to relate to what you're talking about. Um, I actually, had, before I go to this, <laughs> I had a friend back in high school who used to do a lot of acid which is a recreational drug back from, the, I don't even know if people know what acid it is anymore. Pretty powerful drug, a hallucinogenic. And he would set up his speakers in the courtyard of his apartment complex. Uh, with all the apartments would open to the swimming pool. He'd set up his speakers, play music, drop acid, and then try to watch as he hallucinated the sound waves bouncing off the courtyard. Okay, so this guy was really into drugs. And uh, he told me, I remember him saying, Mike, I, I feel like God's pursuing me. I feel like God's pressing in. And, you know, you might attribute that to the fact, dude, you're doing acid. Come on. Uh, but, you know, it was persistent. It was when he was sober, and it, won, it was when he was high. Just all throughout his, his uh, teenage years, he just felt hunted down, this, this little voice drawing him to God. And this is a pretty common experience. You might be able to remember this experience. Uh, this is uh, John Paul Sartre, a French existentialist. And he uh, did not believe in God, died not believing in God. But he admitted in his, some of his memoirs, he says, As for me, I don't see myself as so much dust in the world, but as a being that was expected, prefigured, called forth, in short, as a being that could, it seems, come only from a creator. And this idea of a creating hand that created, uh, created me refers me back to God. He says, this idea contradicts many of my other ideas, but it's there, floating vaguely. And when I think of myself, I often think rather in this way for want of being able to think otherwise. Now, why is it that people who are far from God often have the intrusive thought that God is there? Why is that? It's because he is there. It's because, like Jesus says, yeah, this is Jesus saying, when, when I'm lifted up from the earth, I'll draw 
everyone, every nation, tribe, people, and tongue to myself. And you may be like, well, okay, I just don't, I, that's, that's those people's experience. I, I can't dial into that at all. I don't know what you're talking about. Well, maybe these things will help. These are some of the ways God's actively drawing us right now through nature. When I was in high school, I was hiking in the Smoky Mountains. I went on top of, we camped on top of Spruce Mountain. And it looked like this. And I remember having kind of just an experience where you're just taking it in, the sense of wonder, and you're like, something, some, someone must have, have made this possible. Or maybe if you've studied and looked carefully at the way a cell functions, there's this, the world we live in is screaming out to us that God is here. This is, uh, this is something the Bible talks about in Rome, uh, Romans 1. It says, what can be known about God is plain, and he's, them here is people far from God, because God's shown it to them. His invisible attributes, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world in the things that have been made. That's why in like 95 plus percent of Americans believe in God, because it's hard not to when you live in the world that he created. Another way we hear God's small voices in our hearts, through an ongoing moral inner dialogue that we have, where we, we do different things, and it's like there's this running commentary on the way we're living. If we're impatient, we cut someone else off in traffic, we feel bad, we feel a sense of guilt. Or may, I used to, I, I think I'm too hardened to feel that anymore. But, you know, you do bad things, you feel bad. And you're patient and you help someone, and it just feels right. You, you get this commentary about our choices and our behavior. Well, why is that? Well, the Bible says that even when we're far from God, it demonstrates that God's law is written in our hearts for our own conscience and thoughts are either accusing or, or telling us that we're doing right. And so, yeah, even this, this it's not something that evolved uh, to, to help out the herd or something like that. This moral impulse is God's imprint on you. And that's why we, we have a sense of what's right and wrong, regardless of what's popular in the wider culture. So yeah, and then again, too, through people, obviously. You know, I was thinking back uh, to my own journey to becoming a Christian. Three different people had a huge influence on me. None of them ever met each other. It's not like they, like, let's, let's collaborate and come up with a strategy to reach Mike. That's not what happened. You know, as I look back on what happened, it, what, it, it, what it really looks like to me is that God kept sending person after person after person into my life to tell me about him. And if you're sitting here, maybe that's why you're here. Because God has continued, because he loves you, to keep directing people your way to tell you about him. And so I would just, I would just appeal to you. If you've got this, this sense that you've been in God's tractor beam for a while, and many of us do, don't just write that off to the bean burrito you had last night or something. It's so crucial that you acknowledge, yeah, Lord, I know you're there. I know that, I know that there's ways I've sinned against you, and I appeal to you for forgiveness. And I would urge you, if, if, if you sense that, to do that now. Don't wait. Don't, don't, you know, dither on that decision. Get your questions answer, answered and respond to that voice, because that's the voice of God. Okay, so uh, lastly, too, I just wanted to say, uh, I think it'd be a great mental exercise for us this week to just reflect, if you know the Lord, to reflect on how it is you came to be sitting in your seat. I bet you were a real pain in the butt. If you were anything like me, it's very difficult for God to reach you. Uh, it, it took a lot of people, a lot of patience, a lot of speaking to your heart, but, but God finally landed you in his net. 
Why not, why not just take a little time this week and thank him for that? And why not also, not just thanking him, but asking him to give you the same heart of concern for people that we're seeing in this book? You know, God crossed a universe to reach you and me. He did everything he could, including offering his son for us, because he's passionate about knowing us. And I think, I think we can appeal to God for that same passion. You know, like, Lord, sometimes I don't even care. For a lot of us, you know, even at that level, do I even care about people that are far from God? If, if I'm honest, a lot of, a lot of days I'm, I'm going through my day, hard to see any evidence that I care. But God cares. And God can help me have the burden that he has to reach people. And we should call out to him for that. And as we're sitting there feeling intimidated about talking to people about the Lord, we can remember that long before we ever opened our mouth, in many different ways over many years, God has already been there, already laid the groundwork, already tenderized people's hearts, and we're just partnering with him. We're not acting on our own. We are just coming alongside God and working with him to draw people to himself. And so, yeah, just think about that.